Okay, we are going to call to order the meeting of the Independent School District number 283 on this evening, Monday, February 24th, a couple minutes after 7 p.m. Um, first, we have the approval of the agenda. So first up, this uh, we will have open forum, and we do have a few people who looks like they would like to speak to us tonight. Um, after that, the superintendent's report. Our discussion items this evening will be student research project reports, financial advisory committee recommendations, policy development, first reading of policy 404, employment background check, Policy development, second reading of policy 519, interviews with students by outside agencies. And then we will have our consent agenda. On our action agenda this evening, we have the approval of the second reading of policy 519, the employment agreement of our new children first executive director, and communications and transmittals. Is there a motion to approve the agenda as presented? So moved. Moved by Heather. Is there a second? Second. Second, Anne. All in favor? Aye. Passes 6-0 this evening. Okay. First, we have open forum. I just want to welcome everybody here and say thank you very much for everybody who is in attendance. For those of you who are here for open forum, which we hold the second meeting of, of the month, um, anyone indicating a desire to speak during open forum will be acknowledged by the board chair. That's me. When called upon to speak, please state your name, address, and briefly the topic that you are going to present on. All marks should be addressed to the board as a whole, please, and not to any specific member or person who is not a member of the board. Um, if there are a number of you who are here to present on the same topic, please designate a spokesperson to summarize the issues. Please limit your comment to three minutes. Longer time may be granted at the discretion of the board chair. That's me. Uh, if you have any written comments, um, the board would like to have a copy, which can help us better understand what you're um, presenting on. Um, we will listen to comments. Hey, Ken. We will listen to um, comments, but please know that this is not the time for us to be able to respond to those comments or engage in a conversation. Um, we have a listening session coming up on February 29th. If you would like to have more of a discussion or conversation about your topic at that time, that's at 10 a.m. on um, Saturday the 29th. But please know that your comments are important to us, um, and we will follow up after the meeting as appropriate. Um, and then finally, please be aware that disrespectful comments or any comments of a personal nature directed at an individual, either by name or inference, whether staff member, student, or anyone else, uh, will not be allowed. So, yes. Um, students are not required to give their address on camera. Right. Thanks, Karen. Okay. First up, we have Linda Enright. Yes, up to the podium, please. I think the mic should be working. Hello. Okay, and again, just name, address, and what you're going to talk to us about, and then. Hi, my name is Linda Enright. My address is 3824 Alabama um, Avenue in St. Louis Park, and I'd like to talk about nutrition and wellness in our schools. Um, I lived, I've lived in St. Louis Park for over 20 years. I've had three kids going through the St. Louis Park schools. My education and career is in nutrition. I am also a member of the district's wellness committee and a champion, have been a champion for Health in the Park for the city as well. Uh, access to good nutrition improves students' cognition, their concentration, and their energy levels. It enhances a student's psychosocial well-being. It reduces aggression and decreases discipline problems. I don't think we're doing enough to support good nutrition in our schools. Because of the approved referendum, the construction of new kitchens, and the creation of a district wellness committee, I believe that we're at a turning point in our district with the opportunity to improve the health and wellness of both our students and our staff. But we need to make nourishing our students a high priority. I'm asking for your support of four items today. First, the creation of a city and district-wide food action plan. Second, to support the work of the wellness committee and implementation of our wellness policy. Third, the creation of opportunities for culinary, culinary classrooms at each of our schools. And fourth, to support career pathways in food and health education. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you very much, Ms. Enright, as I say, into the microphone. 
Uh, next up, we have Ariel Steinman. And I should have also noticed that our wonderfully helpful Laura Kruchina is keeping uh, track of the time over there if you wanted to take a look as necessary. Hi, uh, my name is Arielle Steinman. I, my address is 3325 Dakota Avenue South. Um, I work in St. Louis Park uh, with SLP Seeds, which is a nonprofit that works for food security um, here. And um, Sorry, um, <laughs> I wanted to talk about the culinary classroom here in the high school. And I know somebody else is going to talk, be, talk more about its updating, but we are requesting use of this for um, a Green Corps member. Um, as somebody who was in the Peace Corps, um, uh, it really changed my life and really helped me grow a lot as a person. And we have the opportunity to get a Green Corps member to come and work with the school district to help uh, use food waste in redistributing it uh, to the community and to people in need. We've talked to the people who run Bird Feeder, um, as well as DECA and a few other people within the school, and we'd like your support to use that as an office. Um, we've been denied for a, piece, or for a Green Corps member in the past due to not having a um, an office space for them. So that room is not being used currently and we'd love to use it for that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Steinman. Uh, next we have Sharon, Sharon Lerman, Lerman? Lerman. Okay, can you hear me? Okay, thank you. So uh, my name is Sharon Lehrman. I live at 2610 Vernon Avenue South in the Birchwood neighborhood. Um, I am a registered dietitian nutritionist. Um, I'm also a better eating champion for health in the park and a board member of SLP Seeds. Um, I actually grew up in St. Louis Park and graduated from this very high school, but I still get lost when I have to find <laughs> things in the circle. Um, I am here to make a case for a revisioning of the high school culinary classroom, uh, the one in which I myself actually took home ec uh, over 40 years ago, and a space that is essentially going unused through June of 2021. In the past two years, SEEDS has been given access to conduct cooking matters classes for middle school and high schoolers in the culinary classroom, and that was wonderful as well as challenging since we were sharing the space with other teachers' needs unrelated to cooking. Seeds would love to see that space transformed to a true teaching kitchen for our students, as well as a place to grow fresh foods like microgreens, sprouts, and mushrooms. This would allow us to provide fresh produce for our bird feeder students besides the shelf-stable foods they get now. Uh, school gardens and food-based programs can help surmount some of the systemic barriers to eating healthy. A 2015 U.S. Department of Agriculture census of about 18,000 public, private, and charter school districts found 7,101 traditional and hydroponic gardens based in schools. Tom Bravo is working on ways to help us create more gardens, but until that time, dedicating the culinary classroom for full-time use to SEEDS and for the Green Corps office would help cultivate food justice. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, is there anyone else who would like to speak who did not get a chance to complete a yellow form? Going once, going twice? All right, well, I just want to thank um, the three of you women who spoke tonight very much for your advocacy and for uh, taking the time to come out tonight and talk to us about um, something that certainly impacts all of our students and our community as well. So thank you all very much, and we will not be offended if you want to leave right now and <laughs> stay. Okay, next up, we have our superintendent's report by Superintendent Osai. Good evening, Chair Tom Beck, members of the board. This evening for my superintendent's report, I would like to highlight a couple of items connected to our strategic direction. The, the first item that I would like to highlight is the work that we've been conducting 
um, related to out of school time for middle school students and families. With the change in start time for the 2020-2021 school year, we've been working over the past several months to come up with options for students after school that would meet their academic, social, emotional needs. As a part of this work, we've also been looking at ways to create a schedule um, that would allow for our teachers to continue to collaborate during um, the school day. We are currently in the process of seeking feedback from stakeholders regarding the, the ideas that the task force has generated, and we'll be seeking feedback for the remainder of the month of February into the beginning of the month of March, um, and making some final recommendations at that time regarding potential out-of-school time opportunities for middle school students starting in the 2020-2021 school year. The next item that I would like to share connected to our strategic direction is our the work of our high school scheduled task force. Um, similar to the middle school out-of-school time task force, the high school scheduled task force has been meeting for several months and we are at the point in the process in which we've developed a couple of options that we are getting feedback from um, with staff. And um, starting, starting today, we, got, we were starting to get feedback and input from students. Um, there are two options that we'll be looking at getting feedback from. One is a block schedule option, which um, on one day a week, students would have eight periods. And then on the, the, for the remainder of the week, Tuesday through Friday, they would have um, alternating classes every other day, but they would, they would have four classes a day. This would be 80 minute class periods um, with a rotating clubs and um, student help and collaboration time built into the day. The other option that we're in the process of getting feedback on is a seven period model. And this model is very similar to the current model that we have, except for this model no longer has the late starts on Tuesday and Thursday and has the intervention collaboration time built into the school day. So school would start at the same time for students every day and they would be able to get support from, from teachers during the middle of the school day. So we will be continuing to get feedback from students, staff, and, and parents over the next couple of weeks and coming back together as a task force um, in early March to make a final recommendation regarding schedules for the 2021-22 school year. So if there is a decision to change the high school schedule that would not go in effect until the 2021-22 school year. And it was actually quite amusing today as I was in the cafeteria talking to some of our um, current 11th graders because as I mentioned it to them they when I told them when it would start they they told me that they're not interested in having a discussion so I guess they they knew that they wouldn't be here and I told I don't blame them for that um, the the last thing I would like to do is just take a moment to acknowledge our school board members um, as I've as I've mentioned before school board members here in St. Louis Park and all across the state and country work extremely hard to meet the needs of students and families and I would suggest that the school board members sitting in front of you are no different. Um, can, you know, countless hours different task force and, and groups that you all sit on and you do it all to help us move our mission forward and for that we're extremely grateful. I would also like to just members who have experience and gone through every you know, single stage of MSBA training, which is quite a bit of time outside of you know, the, the, the normal responsibility of a school board member and in their professional life and personal life. Um, currently, um, Ann Casey, Mary Tomback, and, and Karen Waters have ex went through every single MSBA school board training, and I appreciate you know, your diligence and commitment to um, furthering your expertise as a school board member. Um, I also want to take this moment in the audience today um, as we're acknowledging school board members. One of my former school board members from the Oss Area School District um, Board Chair, Dean Hinky, is here. Um, just wanted to say hi, right? Mm -hmm. so, but it just speaks to the dedication and commitment that school board members make um, to the staff and, and students and families that they serve. So thank you all for your leadership, and I'm, I'm honored to be able to work for you. And that concludes my report. And thanks for the plants. <laughs> That's very nice. That's why we have greenery and decor on our uh, <laughs> dais this afternoon or this evening. Okay, our first discussion item for the evening is student research project reports. I know we're all excited to hear this. Um, we always like to be able to hear from students. So uh, Dr. Duffy, Director of Curriculum Instruction, and Jill Merkel, 
Kelly Hefstead, our high school teachers, and uh, some students will present to us. They will. Okay. <laughs> Good evening, Chair Tom Beck, members of the board, Superintendent Osai. I am excited tonight to have a large group of presenters that are going to share their projects. Um, as you know, we've been doing a lot of work around culturally relevant pedagogy in our schools and have been using the framework of Gloria Ladson Billings to really frame everything we do in our classrooms under the work of academic success, cultural competence, and critical socio-political consciousness as well. And I think the, pro the projects that you're going to hear about tonight really fit into this um, as well as anything that I've seen. Um, whether it's been in the 11th grade language arts classes where they've been looking through critical literacy and understanding how power and oppression play out or whether it's been through civic engagement in ninth grade social studies classes, these students have taken their projects and put them into um, a way in which they can try to figure out how they can change the educational system in which we all operate and they have taken that research and want to share it with you all to look particularly at what role you might play in helping them make their projects a reality. So um, they have brought many of these projects to us, whether it's been members of the cabinet to their principals to Superintendent Osai already. Um, they've shared it with their teachers. And tonight they want to share it with you and all of the viewing public at home um, to see how they can move forward and make sure that um, what their dreams are um, might become a reality. I want to say, when we talk about cultural competence and critical consciousness, these terms can sometimes be something that are sort of abstract. Um, but if you look at them together, um, there's a piece that we talked about right before the students came in today that sort of illustrates what we mean. A lot of times cultural competence, when we hear it or we talk about it, and we talk about diversity, um, we have a very limited and discrete view of that as just of what we see. And although we need to understand the intersection of race and culture when we have these conversations, we had a conversation today about the notion that, and what we noticed, that almost all of the, well, all of the people that are presenting here tonight are women, other than me. Young women presenting and seeing themselves and potentially that they saw themselves in the teachers that called upon them to be here tonight. And it made us wonder, at least made me wonder, with a diverse teaching staff, what would our presenters look like? And we talked about that noticing and whether or not we should bring it up here tonight and what that would mean for critical consciousness and what that would mean for our conversations about cultural competence. And I actually recalled a situation and I appreciated the setting in Ms. Hefstead's classroom where I was in there speaking and waxing philosophical, if you believe it or not, about educational policies um, in her 11th grade English class. And a student um, stopped me and said, we were in circle, and he said, what are you? And I said, well, I'm the, I'm the director of curriculum instruction. And he goes, no, what are you? And I said, do you mean, like, where are my ancestors from? And he said, yeah. And I said, well, from the Middle East, from Lebanon. And he goes, I knew it. I'm not the only one. And I said, oh. And it struck me that I had never really shared that part of myself openly with people. And that although when people see me on the outside, they might just see my whiteness, but they don't necessarily know what other parts of me are there until they get to know me. And it made me wonder what else we need to see about these presenters tonight and what they're going to share with us about their research and how that will tell us more about who they are as well. So I'm going to turn it over to these young presenters now. Hello and good afternoon, school board members. <laughs> um, I am Anna McCallan and uh, I'm Cameron Holly. We're both in ninth grade. Uh, we presented to, or we did our project about uh, school stressors and uh, mental health and how they affect students' lives. I have personal experience with this. I had open heart surgery when I was 12 years old, so two years ago. And um, from that, I have uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, and I've always had very severe anxiety, and school has played a big part in that. 
and um, it has not always been easy in um, in school with all the homework and projects. It sometimes, well, a lot of times gets very overwhelming, and it um, seems like it's very hard to get things done, and um, that school is just a very kind of like um, hard thing to get through, especially high school with excessive homework and um, projects. So according to our research, 83% of students across the country are like significantly, significantly affected by school stress. And when we talked to our classmates, they definitely said it played a big role in their lives with all the projects, homeworks, and just a big workload. And we also were researching about like organizations or laws that help students with this, but there really was nothing we could find. And we think a really big problem is like school stress is looked at as something that is just normal and then you have to deal with, and it's not really looked at as like a problem that can be fixed. So we think this is definitely something that should be looked at and worked on. Um, we were just, um, I, what I have personal learn, personally learned from doing this project is that I am not alone in school stress, is that a lot of people around the country, and it's very common to have actually more than normal stress about school and anxiety and worrying about your GPAs and ACT scores, and it's very, um, it's very overwhelming for kids and it's very just interesting to see that I am not alone and everybody is not alone in school stress and how much um, and their mental health. Thank you so much for your consideration. Hello, good evening. I'm Molly Horseman Olson. I'm a ninth grader here at the high school and um, our project was excessive homework and the stress that it causes to uh, high school students in particular, but all students, and yeah. Um, I'm Ruby Levon, and part of the reason why I specifically wanted to research this topic was that not only like when we were researching this that it was such like at that time for finals it was a lot, but also when like thinking about what classes I'm going to take, the anticipated homework stress of knowing that the honors classes and the AP classes are more and the IB classes, that it actually kept me from going as far as I could when it came to taking the AP environmental science course this year in ninth grade. Um, I actually chose to not take that course, not because I wouldn't be able to be in the class and learn, but because of all the homework on top of all my other classes then I knew that that would be too much for me. Um, and as a student who did choose to take the AP Environmental Science, it is a lot of homework. Um, uh, we took a survey with the classes and we found that most students have two to three hours of homework a night, which might not really seem like a lot, like it kind of seems normal, but if you add in, so you have your hours at school, right? And you get home, and you have two to three hours of homework. Plus that, you have dinner, you have extracurricular activities, you have family time, you have literally anything else you would be doing at that time, including like just relaxing time. And students, um, high school students need nine and a quarter hours of sleep every night. And I know for a fact that most of the people I know do not get that at all, any night, ever. Um, and we just think that it is a very big problem. Thank you for your consideration. Hello, um, I'm Hope Kehanya, I'm an 11th grader. And my topic primarily focused on mental health and its effects on graduation rates and students in general. Um, I was shocked to find out that 40% of kids who don't graduate suffer from mental health issues and I thought this topic was really important because although mental health is being less and less stig stigma, uh, stigmatized, um, that kids are still struggling to like be able to be honest and tell their teachers what they're going through. And I feel like if teachers were um, maybe like taught like more about the signs of like like 
like to see whether or not a kid is actually going through something, that that would help the kid feel more open about um, telling their teacher. I personally suffer from um, mental health issues. I have anxiety and depression, and I've seen myself several times not being able to tell my teacher or being too scared or too shy, but when I have teachers that actually know like what it's like or at least have a deeper understanding of it, I feel a lot more comfortable and I want that for all students that go to St. Louis Park to be able to feel comfortable telling their teachers what's going on and for those teachers to acknowledge that and accommodate for that. Um, what I took away from this project was that um, a lot of kids like me are going through a lot and um, school can be very difficult for them and that um, they just want to feel more comfortable in their classroom setting. Thank you for your Hi, my name is Sophie Yakes. I'm a junior here, and I also picked the topic of mental health. Um, I'm personally affected by it, so that's why I chose it, and because I think that it's not talked about, and it's still, while it's becoming less and less stigmatized, it still needs, it still deserves to be talked about and still deserves to be um, looked into because if you look around there are a lot of kids that are doing really well in high school but there are also a lot of kids who are really struggling a lot of days and that's not fair because that really affects their focus in class out of class and a lot of kids turn to other things to try to help which in turn usually don't help um, I researched this topic by um, in my English class we did infographics so I researched a couple of different things that um, classes or schools do to try to help. So um, music programs, I play I play in the orchestra, I play violin, and I know that it's the, one of the best parts of my day is being able to just kind of relax and have the music um, help me and just kind of move me. Um, so I really would highly suggest, you know, supporting the orchestra and supporting our performing arts programs. And also just because a lot of kids deal with it, I know I'm not the only one it can be really, really difficult to get out of bed and much less get on the bus or get in the car to go to school a lot of days. Um, and I learned that through my infographic and through my letter that I actually wrote to Miss Bussy, that people listen. And if you want them to listen, they will. They're here for you. And I was originally going to write my letter. I was like, oh, I'll just write it to like Michelle Obama or something, because then I won't have to deal with it again. But um, I'm glad that I wrote it to Miss Bussy because. I got a pass one day, and I was like, uh oh, I hope I'm not in trouble. But um, it was actually for a meeting with her about, and with a couple of other students who had the same topic as I. And we got to talk about it and say, what can we do about it? And my suggestion is to enforce it more in the curriculum, because a lot of people are uneducated about it, um, students and teachers. And I think it would just be an amazing experience for a lot of people to be able to learn more about it and be more aware about it. Thank you. Um, hello, um, my name is Fiona Schock. This is Fiona Long, and this is Katie Crocker, and we are in ninth grade. Um, the topic we chose was try to get feminine, feminine hygiene product dispensers with free products in the SLP high school bathrooms. Um, we chose this topic because we believe that having these products is a necessity and not a luxury. We've all had experience where we did not have access to these products. Um, we also know that other people, a lot of people in the school also face not having access to these products. Um, we know that sometimes there can be a lot of negative stigma around talking about periods and menstruation, but we really believe that this is a problem that needs to be addressed. So we polled students and 70% um, of girls that we polled said that they've been in a situation where they needed a pad or tampon and didn't have access to one. And 97% of students said that they believe that this is, would be a value and would help students here at SLP. Also, as you probably know, 32.2, I, I think, uh, percent of students here get free or reduced lunch. So that really shows, shows a need for these products that are really necessities to helping these girls uh, thrive in their education. We believe um, that so the, there, these products are available at the nurse's office, but that process can be actually um, really embarrassing for many girls, and a lot of people don't even know where the nurse's office, which is a problem in, in itself. Um, and so we believe that having these in the bathroom would be great. Uh, no girl should have to go through the day without a pad or tampon when she needs it, because that can be uncomfortable, stressful, and can obviously be a detriment to her education. 
So yeah, that's what we want to do. Thank you. I think now would just be a good time just to interject quickly that we're going to. <laughs> Done. <laughs> My name is, um, hello, my name is Rosalina Sanchez. I'm a junior here. My project is on discrimination. Discrimination in our school hallways is a problem, and I'm not so sure our classrooms are even safe anymore. Last week on Wednesday during fourth period in my pottery class, a boy made a rude remark. It started out with him sounding frustrated, like someone had offended him. As I listened closer, he started going on about how people are weird nowadays. He spoke about a non-binary peer. <clears throat> he told us about his conversation with that peer. At first, he called them a she. That peer corrected him by saying they aren't a she. He then called them a he. They corrected him once more by telling him what pronouns they preferred. They, them, there. He doesn't finish his story about the rest of the conversation. But he did say people are weird and need to make up their minds. And I quote, people need to stop being so sensitive, end quote. I understand he may have a different background. His family may not be tolerant of LGBTQ, but they should at least educate him on how to mind his own business. I've seen fat shaming. I've seen girls calling one another sluts. I've seen kids picked on just because of the clothes they were wearing. I've seen kids looked down upon just because of their race. Things gotta change. A solution, in my opinion, is an educated video, or perhaps an educated paper, one that you send home with the, chil the child. And not only do they have to work on it, but their parents too. That's where the problem stems. Kids don't, kids don't develop bad thoughts, or Kids don't make up their minds on their own. Kids are born pure, but once tainted, I guess you could say, their minds could be made up. We need to prevent discrimination in a way so we could prevent depression, stress, suicide, etc. What I took away from this is Discrimination isn't dead. Discrimination isn't just on race. It's well around, and nobody seems to care. Thank you. I wish that one were easier, as easy to solve. We're going to open it up now for questions and comments. Do you have any questions? <laughs> We're all, we all think I need a moment. Just a second. First of all, thank you, everybody. You were um, doing exactly what we would like IB critical thinkers to do. You took risk in an appropriate way. You're very respectful, and you're giving us a lot to think about. Um, it would be helpful to see uh, more of the actual research citations to help with the evidence gathering that we need as we take a look at the different issues and then how we're going to allocate resources toward each of these issues. So that would be helpful to have that be provided. And thank you to the teachers for leading this effort with our students. I don't have a question, but um, <clears throat> I just want to say thank you. And wow, <laughs> the things that you are all looking at and talking about, I can't imagine myself as a ninth grader or an 11th grader being as brave and wonderful as you all are. Um, you've, like Karen said, you've given us a lot to think about. 
Um, and these are very real issues. And bringing them to our attention is really important. And it's especially important to hear it from you, the students. So thank you. And you know, good luck with your project. <laughs> I have lots of questions, but I think I'm going to save some of them and maybe more individually and just say what I fear is that this is just the tip of the iceberg. We're just hearing from a small section of students and how many, this is, you know, we have 400 kids in each grade and the individual things that they're feeling and, and all of these things and other things. And so it's really um, powerful. It's always powerful for me to hear personal experiences and to hear from all these students who are taking a big risk, like we said. Um, they are speaking and speaking eloquently. Um, I, I'm a you know trained high school public speaking teacher, and I was proud of every single kid that got up there um, to share share their experiences because I know what it takes to put something like that together and then to be brave and come up here and speak in front of other people and share those things. So I think, um, like I said, so many questions stirring in my mind, but just wanted to say my appreciation for just sharing as much as everybody did today. Thank you. Um, if the last student that presented, what was your name again? Um, as many of you know, I'm a Park graduate, 1998. So yeah, go Orioles. Um, being local, immediate, and very personal, um, it saddens me to hear that that is still your experience here because um, unfortunately mine was very similar to yours. I think that we as a school district, we offer excellent educational opportunities for our students, but we still have a lot of work to do because if we even have one student that feels like that, then we are not doing our job. Um, I'd like to thank all of you for bringing your concerns to us, and it lets us know that yes, while we are offering these spaces for you to form these ideas and these solutions, the fact that they exist and that we are not um, as aware of them as we should be means that we have work and I myself take that very seriously. Um, Rosa, I truly hope and I, I know that you will be stronger and you will survive and it, guess what, it does get better. <laughs> it does. Um, thank you for sharing your story. I think that we need to hear that and know that that is the reality for some of our students. Well, I'll just conclude by um, thanking Dr. Duffy for making sure that we heard this presentation tonight, and thank you so much to the teachers. And I know many of you did write letters, um, send emails, and to the people who answered them. Um, thank you for this work, because you all are going to be the ones who are sitting at tables like this eventually. And so this advocacy is starting now, and it will serve everyone in the whole, in St. Louis Park, in the state, in the country better, because you're starting so early. Um, and to follow up on what I said, uh, Superintendent Osai told me that we will be having dispensers in the bathrooms, and um, I think from a gender equity standpoint, they need to be free supplies in there for every reason that you mentioned. So I'm just, I can't make any decisions at this moment, but I'm saying I would like that to happen. I'm hoping everybody's listening to me. Um, and then to Ms. Sanchez, I also wanted to say the very last thing you said is that no one cares. and I completely understand that that is very much how it feels sometimes. Um, but I want you to know that there are many people that do care, and those of us who care and have power promise you that we will um, continue to do what we can and to do better so that, um, as Laura said, you're, um, that is not the experience that students have at St. Louis Park schools. So thank you all very much, particularly those of you who spoke about mental health and stress. You just put yourselves through a lot to come stand in front of the school board on a Monday night. So um, your courage and um, uh, bravery is obvious and uh, again, a benefit to all of us. So thank you very much.
right, no offense to the Financial Advisory Committee, but <laughs> you guys have a really long <laughs> uphill battle to captivate our attention in the same way. I don't know that we'll get the same applause, but. Uh. Well, it depends. Let's see what you've got to tell us about right. the numbers. Uh, hi, my name is David Larson, and this is Brian Kelly. Uh, and we are just a couple members of the Finance Advisory Committee. Um, i got to figure out how to drive the, our agenda here. Um, so this is uh, kind of the agenda that we ran through during the year. Uh, uh, we're going to talk a little bit here about the members and our purpose, our 2020 approach, uh, and some of our considerations. We'll walk through some of the revenue drivers to the budget and talk a little bit about the fund balance, the current economic considerations and how they may impact uh, what we think are potentially future funding sources for the district and then our overall recommendations. Um, so here are the FAC members from this year. I would point out there's only, under the community side, last year there was only four people with little stars by them. Uh, and there's a lot more this year. And uh, so last year we had just the four of us, Julia, Steve, myself, and Katie, who I think you've all met. Uh, and then typically we had one school board member, um, and then Brooks and Patricia, and uh, no students. And so one of the things that Patricia wanted to do was expand the number of folks that we had on the committee this year um, and you know in part to try and help expand on some of the transparency which we'll touch on here in a minute um, as well as just to get some additional feedback from people um, and because in this case if we can get more uh, more thoughts about what's going on and more ideas that potentially that's a that's a good thing so there was an expansion of the fact members for this year uh, our purpose is to advise the administration and the uh, SLP school board on economic and school finance issues and build community trust in district finances. And again, I think expansion of our uh, finance advisory committee was one, of the, was one of the things we were looking at there. So. Thanks, David. So the 2020 approach, uh, we just touched on the expanded membership. And the one thing that stood out to me, being a brand new member, is we had a, I believe we ended up with a community member from every building. So every elementary school, middle school, high school, uh, which is just a, great to hear different experiences and a few that have been through the district and a few that are like me still in elementary school with two kids. Um, basically focus on educating the committee uh, those of us that are new in particular, <laughs> it's very interesting and enlightening just to hear how the different factors work, uh, what the different um, uh, drivers are of the revenue and expenses and those sorts of things and try to get a handle on how it all fits together. And then lastly, improve transparency. Uh, in particular, the meeting materials are all available on the district website. Uh, but the interesting thing we did at the first meeting, we broke into small groups and had each group define trust. And there were four groups, and every group had transparency come out of their, uh, their, their group. So that was a big focus on how are we transparent. Uh, we had conversations around. Um, I, one that sticks out to me is there was some talk of a fund that was being funded one place, and we had money elsewhere, so we funded it here. And I was like, no, 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 keep it in one place. Like, if I'm a community member trying to read this stuff, keep the line item in the same place so we can find it and, and can track it if, we wanna, if people want to follow it that closely. So a few things like that that came up that really – were interesting and I think can help just drive transparency among the community. You up, All right. Yeah. All right. Um, so again, some of the primary factors that we discussed, the transparency of the district finance, finances. Uh, we talked about the state of Minnesota and its economic outlook. The, the, the per diems are, incre are set, the increases next year are already set, so we're trying to look out a little bit further to see what those might look like in the future as we're trying to figure out uh, what type of revenue increases we'd see. Um, we looked at the financial planning model and focused kind of on the enrollment side of it uh, and the revenue drivers and the expense management piece of that. Uh, we talked quite a bit about uh, budget variances and, and 
how we could uh, track those and, and uh, uh, communicate those better. Um, the, uh, we started talking about the general unassigned fund balance policy um, and, and other program metrics. Um, I will say, you know, there was, in terms of the expense management side, there wasn't a lot of discussion on that. About 85%, give or take, of the, of the dollars spent are on salaries and benefits, so there isn't a lot to, to push around or talk about there. The contract is settled, uh, um, and so there wasn't a lot of discussion there. Uh, in terms of the budget variances, we did talk about the concept of trying to introduce, you know, a forecast versus budget, which we'll, uh, which we'll touch on later, in part because as the budgets are developed, I think it's in June when the budget for the next year is, is set out, you don't know exactly how many teachers you got, you don't know exactly how many kids are going to be in the seats and things like that. And, uh, and so trying to basically take off and, and effectively reforecast those dollars so that people can see which way is it trending, is it trending higher or lower relative to what you kind of started the year with was an important thing we wanted to, to introduce. Um, so uh, the majority of the general fund is derived from basic revenue. So what basically happens is if you look at the number of children uh, in uh, K to five, and you take that number times one, and or K to six, and take the number of kids in seven to 12 times 1.2, you come up with an APU. Uh, and that is what is used by the legislature uh, for funding purposes. So in our case, we've got about 4,600 students, give or take, every year, and it translates into roughly about 5,000 or 5,100 APUs, and that becomes the basis for the, for the funding from the state. Uh, and here was a breakdown, or is a breakdown, of the various uh, number of, of, this is number of students in the seats uh, right now, and, and kind of where we see it trending, uh, or where it has, and, and where we're projecting it out over the next three years. Um, I'd point out a couple things here. You know, we've been running, it, it, we don't have a total at the top of these bars, but there were 4,583 students in 2015, 4,607 in, in 16, 4,606, 4,624, 4,577. We're running around 4,600 students uh, per year that are, that are coming through, and it equates to typically between 5,050 and 5,100 5, APUs. And, and so um, what I kind of take as a, from this is, you know, first of all, the the buildings are pretty full, so there isn't an ability to bring in much more right now, but that's what will, will happen in a couple of years as the, the new facilities come on, particularly at the middle school um, and finished up here so we can take on more students. Um, right now we've got about 15% of our kids are uh, filling out seats from open enrollment, which is a great thing. We're, I think we typically lose about 500 and we're picking up about 700. So that extra 200 students means a lot. Um, through the various funding sources, there's probably about $15,000 a kid that comes through. So if we, um, if there was no open enrollment, we'd be down about $3 million in revenue right now. So open enrollment has not been a bad thing for St. Louis Park. And as these buildings come online and there's more seats available, that potentially is gonna become a big revenue source for us. Right now, we're kind of capped on that end. Uh, after looking at some of the numbers for the year, uh, the FAC is recommending that we use 5,100 APUs for the year, um, and which is about 50 kids more than what it would be this year, really based primarily on we have a small 12th grade class and there's perceived to be a larger incoming class from the kindergarten side. So that's gonna make up most of the seats. You know, translated in APUs, it's gonna be about 5,100. So that's where we thought we would come in at. Brian, back to you. One, one quick enrollment note. Uh, Patricia, I believe you developed this, but I was really impressed. There, the, her office has a model based on births in Hennepin County and formulas and capture rates and it was like, you kind of don't know if it's going to be right or not, but but having being exposed to it for the first time was like, okay, we have a formula to work from, and now we can start to figure out where we're going from there. So I was very impressed by that. Um, 
this is the formula allowance history, so the increase of uh, funding from the legislature. Uh, we know right now it's set at 2% for these next two years. Obviously, there's a total unknown beyond that, but uh, we're working off that 2% as a continued number as we go forward. And then other revenue drivers, again, very interesting learning as a new member. Uh, special education is very variable, dependent on other districts in the state. And uh, you actually don't know what, what it is until like six months after the year's over. <laughs> so <laughs> running a business myself, I was like, how do you even do that? It seems crazy. But uh, it appears that this year we're going to be a little ahead of last year um, based on uh, the estimates we have right now. And uh, anticipating that, we're really not counting on it yet, but anticipating that and then staying flat to that level going forward. And then in uh, this current school year, student fees were increased. We just got numbers last week that uh, the revenues are about 20,000 higher and participation was the same. So that seems to have worked well to drive a little bit of revenue and maintain participation in the activities. And so recommendation wise, we're, we would say kind of maintain special education flat to what it will be at the end of this year and then maintain the student fees flat as well uh, after the increase last year. All right. Um, well, one thing I'd point out, too, when we talk special ed uh, revenues that are coming in, and again, we are looking backwards. We're getting some reimbursement in arrears for what we did last year and so on. Um, to see an increase there isn't necessarily a good thing because we get about 60 cents on the dollar for every dollar we spend. So if we're seeing increases in our reimbursement, it means there's incrementally more dollars that we have had to spend in order to support those programs. So it's, it's, it's a bit counterintuitive that, you know, if we had, if we spent less on that, we might actually have more for other programs. But, um, so, um, all right. The, uh, we talked about next the, uh, the fund balance. And um, the, as it says, the school board has talked about in the past an unreserved general fund balance you know, we need it for cash flow reasons, you know, if there are legislative shortfalls or changes, tax abatements, other unanticipated needs. Um, and we've talked about a target of 6% of the unreserved fund balances as being the target. I think one of the things that, that came out of our discussions was let's change maybe our vernacular here a little bit and talk more about is that, should that be more of a floor and there's more of a target that we're kind of focused on where as we're, fall, as we're climbing above that, we think about are there additional programs we can expand to use as we start and fall below that. That's, you know, so there's a gap between maybe what is our target and, and what is our minimum. And so the question would be is this, you know, should 6% be considered minimum instead of a target? Um, but in any event, then here's how some of the uh, unassigned fund balances have rolled throughout the year. Um, the last column that you see there uh, in the light shade, that is um, the concept of this forecast that we have uh, introduced this year. And so back in June of 2019, there would have been a budget that called for a shortfall of about two and a half million dollars. Um, but since then, there have been some known changes that have occurred over the, you know, some of the enrollments were a little bit higher, some of the expenses have coming in a little bit lower. There were some additional revenue sources that were found, for instance, the special education would be one. And so as you now kind of blend this forward, you look at it and say, okay, instead of going from a 10.6 to an $8.6 million uh, unassigned budget, it looks like we found, uh, you know, that, that, the, that the hole isn't going to be quite as deep based on how we've been able to reforecast some of those things. And so in terms of trying to add some of the transparency into where we're at, if we, if we know we've got changes and, and probably some of the, the first things that Patricia is going to know about is, okay, how is enrollment looking versus what we kind of thought it was at? Because you look at October 1st and you know now the number of, of kids in the seats and you got some idea of how much that's going to attrit over the year. What does that translate into APUs and what does that do relative to the budget that we had set up? So we may find next year that, okay, we budgeted 5,100 APUs and it's coming in more like 5080, right? Well, take those 20 kids and what does that do to our funding? And so rather than just having twice a year that you're talking about budget, 
and then a revised budget to have some idea of how this is reforecasting through. And so that's what the attempt was at the last bar. And I think everybody appreciates you putting that in there because that I found that very helpful. Uh, and then here were some fund balance comparisons to other districts and uh, you know where we're at and where other districts are at um, again our discussion was uh, centered around maybe redefining the six percent that we had as more of a minimum rather than a target and if we look down where some of these other districts are that seems to be consistent with where others are at maybe actually slightly lower um, so our recommendation would be to establish a 6% minimum and then start having some discussions about where would this target end up that would allow you, if you start seeing some shortfalls come into play, where you don't have to impact programs yet, you can take a little bit of a slower approach rather than you hit the floor and suddenly you've got to make you know, some really hard changes and turns, whether it's with staff or programs, um, so that, that uh, that would be one of our big recommendations. We are currently still in a deficit spending of about a million dollars a year. Um, and the FAC really believes that the dollars really should be viewed as sort of one-time funds that wouldn't necessarily be used for ongoing reoccurring expense subsidy that we find ways to keep that, that budget in relative balance. All right, a few notes on the economic outlook. Um, the, um, the economic outlook from the state of Minnesota has improved since 2019, but there's still a forecast, uh, a forecasted slowdown out into the future. Um, I, I work in the financial services industry, so I hear a lot of these things, and I've heard a lot of good things about the economy, but I think we're coming up to that point of, oh, like full employment, and it's hard to generate more uh, economic growth out of that is one uh, personal note I would throw in there. Uh, they may be coming on that. Uh, the budget outlook uh, has an automatic allocation to the reserve account. Uh, so it's bringing that to $2.3 billion at the state level. Um, there is anticipated growth in revenue continued uh, into the 2022-2023 budget run. Um, actually, there's an update coming Thursday, Patricia, is that right? Yeah, so there's another update to the state outlook this Thursday. They'll be released, so we'll know more then. Um, you can see unemployment there is below the U.S. rate in Minnesota is below the U.S. rate, excuse me. And then uh, this year is not a funding year in the legislature. So we don't anticipate a lot of changes coming on that front uh, at this point in time. So just a summary of the different uh, recommendations we've, we've touched on. Uh, that calculation of actual kids in seats to the APU number, that 5,100 is a, a good working number. Uh, kind of working off the 2% uh, increases to funding holding that special education revenue at the same level as we wrap up this year. Uh, down to the fiscal recommendation, so holding student fees flat, uh, as we mentioned before. Uh, big one would just be not, not that there need to be cuts, but to manage the expenses, especially around payroll and, and benefits. And then the, probably the biggest one is this minimum concept to the, uh, the fund balance and making sure that there's more of a um, grasp around what that means if you're down to 6% and how it's going to work. And we have a picture of our group. Mm -hmm. And I think we have a video, too. Do you have that? Sure. Um, under the fiscal recommendations where it says focus on managing expenses, primarily salaries and benefits, can you explain, I know that you said that doesn't mean necessarily cutting, but what would that look like then? Uh, our discussion in the group was that we look at the budget, we kind of see how it's operating and don't feel like we need to sound alarm bells, but we know the biggest driver of the expenses are salaries and benefits. And so basically, in my opinion, those should always be managed very diligently um, and just continue down that path. Uh, in, until some point we know more about either having more resources available or, or needing to make more uh, dramatic cuts. And I, I think the other color I'd add is, you know, um, if, the, if we're getting 2% increases, but we've got, you know, 3.5% increases in the salaries and it's 80, 85% of the budget, 
um, you know, you can suddenly be running, you know, increasing your your deficit year over year uh, fairly quickly. And it's not dollars that go away. They build upon each other. So it, it isn't like you spend it this year one time and it's gone. It, it, it now embeds in your budget and is, is you know, creating a, a consistent shortfall. On the fund balance policy, um, I noticed that I think it's Wayzata has a range, um, and I know that Intermediate District 287, um, I sit on that board, and we also have a range of um, I think six to eight percent. Um, would you recommend a range um, as the policy, or more of a two different um, two different targets? You know what I'm I, asking? I I think the consensus was. We, the 6% be used as more, be redefined as more of a minimum. Once you hit that minimum, you have got to, to, to swing around and make cuts to, to get that back up above that level. And if it's a, if you've got more of a target, and again, the discussion, that, I mean, it's like we were sort of throwing out numbers, is it 10%, is it 12%, is it, is it what, you know, what percent should that be where you can look at, okay, let's, we can take some dollars and expand some programs or wait a minute, we're, we're now we're down below that target, maybe we need to, to pull some things back and you know so that so that you're able to do things slowly rather than abruptly uh, whether and and again the biggest lever to pull is employment and that isn't necessarily something you want to do I was just gonna say we, we discussed the idea of a target at 12 percent a minimum at six and uh, I guess we landed on it's kind of your job to figure out the target as <laughs> making decisions and the minimum was our idea <laughs> you guys were thinking so thank you <clears throat> um, just want to say thanks again I'm it's exciting to see the committee with such community membership and that as you said representation from each school I'm really excited to see that we have so many people embracing this and I got to sit in on one meeting and it was really interesting to see people who are so passionate about this stuff I thought maybe it would be dry looking at numbers kind of thing but it was people really articulate are better than I can articulating um, what it means what those numbers look like how to understand that what what do people do in the business sense and how things are different for us in education which is pretty significant I think and one of the things so that leads to one of my questions or point of clarification for people who are following at home that largely what we're talking about here right now is general fund dollars and we have several other buckets of money that have limitations on what we do so if people think oh we have referendum money we can move around and things like that what we're talking about here is really general fund dollars when we're talking um, APUs yep and and I think when you when you start thinking about the the unassigned fund balance too as, as you look down the road the next couple three years there are going to be a lot of changes coming into play right you're bringing on new buildings what are those expenses going to look like you've added a central kitchen what are those you know are there going to be a lot more costs there that are going to be coming through and so as, as you start working through some of those uncertainties over the next couple of years and then seeing what reality is, to have, you know, a, a more robust fund balance certainly helps, you know, smooth that out while you then settle in it at what your new reality is. I'd just like to add um, my appreciation for the idea of the minimum and a target. You know, I've personally been thinking through this as we've been discussing fund balance stuff for the last couple of years, and we do sit at about 16% right now. And what I like personally about the idea of a minimum, a floor, and then a target is that gives us permission to spend what we have above the target. And I think that that's something that I've personally struggled with, you know, the idea that all of us even experience in our own finances about you just, you kind of want your bank account, you know, your, your savings account to be as big as possible. And if you just go with that mentality that it should always be as big as possible, then you maybe forego a family vacation or you, you know, don't do other things that you would otherwise do if you say, this is what our minimum is going to be in the excess or the target is going to be in the excess above that, we should be spending. And in this case, to the benefit of our students, perhaps, and to the benefit of our community. So I think it, for, it's helping me kind of process a little bit, like how we, live with that fund balance and what that might mean and so I, I personally appreciate the the advice and the guidance and all of your discussions along those lines to help inform us as we evaluate it when it comes time to do so so thank you guys videos yeah, yeah. I just to say a couple of things I think I remarked last year I was really new at the time and this is not this is uncommon to have 
community members doing the presentation, and it made me really nervous <laughs> last year. I was a little less, I was quite a bit less, less nervous this year. Um, so we should, I'm really um, thankful for this group of people who also care about this work um, that's really important and can be an exciting conversation to be a part of, and you do not have to be a financial wizard like these two to be a part of the conversation, and that's one, I wanted to just get a message out that um, part of building community trust is to get access to this information to as many as possible, and our work got so much better this year. We, you know, you guys named a couple of places, adding that forecast item, thinking about the ways we present budget variances, they were putting the information on the website, just those things um, made us get more clear in the finance office and really make it make the information more accessible to our community. So we really want to continue to expand the finance committee. I was hoping that we would have a more diverse um, finance committee racially. Um, that didn't happen yet. But I do believe that the act of creating transparency and opening up the work, because most of our systems were built in whiteness and in, in financial systems and budgeting systems, and by opening up that work, it's an act of anti-racism. That this, the the opening up and the transparency is a, is a, inviting the community to come in and evaluate our work and challenge it, and hopefully we will begin to um, help the finance community look more accessible and we'll have and a place where someone's opinions and thoughts might actually be heard, and that it's not a waste of time. And so I'm hoping that we'll get more applicants. We'll continue to seek more applicants. So we increased our membership. Financial um, experience isn't necessary. And um, we do have a, a quick little video here. I want to show you one of our finance committee members, um, Jessica, helped us create a little video. Um, Katie actually came up with a couple of questions. Why did you join finance advisory committee and what did you learn? So this is just after a meeting, um, after our last meeting actually, um, a few of our finance committee members, some experienced ones, a student, who's on the finance committee playing basketball right now downstairs, and um, some of our new committee members. So this is some of the thoughts they had. Oh, I don't know who I thought was gonna do that for me. <laughs> Hi, my name is Brian Kelly. I'm a parent at Aquila Elementary. I have my third grader and fifth grader. I joined the committee for the first time this year as I'm interested in learning more about the finances and how the district operates and having more insight. You ready? Yep. Okay. I'm Katie Lawler. I am a parent of two Peter Hobart children. I've been on the committee for several years. I joined because I wanted to get involved in the community, being new to St. Louis Park, um, and knowing that I was going to have kids in the district for many, many years. And I wanted to have a better understanding of how the district operates and have some input into the education environment for my kids. I'm Aaron Ellingson. Uh, I work in the finance department at the school store. And that's kind of how I got into this I, through connections with Ms. Ross. Hi, I'm Jessica Bussey, and I am the assistant principal at the high school. And I joined the finance committee because I was a math teacher before I became an assistant principal. And I really like numbers and knowing the why behind where money goes and what our money is spent on in the district. And I think it's really important that we're informed. Uh, Richard Benson, uh, I have two kids in the district, uh, first and second grade on PSI. Uh, the reason I joined uh, is simply to gain a better understanding of the finances of the school district. Uh, and honestly, that's uh, really what I got out of it. Uh, I have a lot more in-depth knowledge about the finances of the school district. Um, in particular, the, the enrollment projections were really interesting to me, um, learning about those. So it's been a great experience, and uh, I feel like uh, hopefully I can provide more uh, input in the future. It was a very enlightening experience. There's a ton of complexity. Uh, and just getting a handle on how the finances work and what the different decision points are has been a great learning experience. And look forward to years in the future with more knowledge and background to be able to um, one of the things that I have learned this year is that um, our money is spent and um, really allocated in great ways um, and that our fund balance has a lot of variety to it. Um, I also really appreciated the um, clarity that Patricia 
gives us around finance and enrollment and the calculations that she does behind the scenes. Environment for my kids. And I have gotten out of this experience a great deal. I have a much deeper understanding of how the district is funded, how the district operates, what our priorities are, and I do feel like I have a voice, and I appreciate that. And one thing that I got out of it, I think just seeing the comparisons of how the simple school store calculations and all that compares to the district-wide um, enrollment projections and kind of budgets and, and how that money goes around. So it makes me appreciate kind of people who are uh, working for the district and um, are dealing with a lot of big numbers like that. Okay, thank you all very much and please pass along our thanks to the rest of the committee. Okay, next up, policy development, first reading, policy 404, employment background check. Flower, can you take us through um, any relevant information here? Yes, so you'll notice that um, there is an MSBA red line update to the procedure section under point C. Um, our director of human resources require also made some changes to um, more in the procedures section, but the big change that you'll notice um, from what he um, did to the policy is that section four criminal history consent form has been taken out. Um, now everything is done electronically so that there's not a physical form that needs to be signed. Okay, but I, we obviously still need. Correct, it just needs, it's all done electronically so there's not the actual form. And um, so in the 14 years um, since the last time this board looked at this policy, um, the state law and the MSBA model policy have changed, um, but before the, the most recent model policy. So we have missed a couple, I think. Um, and so Flower and I have already kind of looked at the current model policy, um, namely that the language of who um, the background check um, is required of includes um, both um, those who are individuals who are offered employment in a school and all individuals except enrolled student volunteers who are offered the opportunity to provide athletic coaching services or other extracurricular academic coaching services to the school. Um, that's in state law and that is in the in the MSBA model policy. And so there's a bunch of places where that just that kind of um, needs just needs to be added. So um, I'm gonna go through and find all those places and kind of do a little find and replace um, for flower for our next meeting if that's if that's okay with the group. That's fantastic. Thank you so much, Anne, for being on top of that. Um, anybody else? Uh, anybody have any um, concerns regarding equity with anything that's stated in this policy as written? Or anything else we should be considering along those lines? On that note, I mean, uh, I, uh, having read the law now, <laughs> um, it is largely statutory, um, very much so. It's, there's not a lot of wiggle room that we would have um, from that perspective. That was actually my recollection as well. I mean, it makes sense. We are um, employing people to most of whom will be working day in and day out with students who are considered a vulnerable population. So let's make sure that um, our students are kept safe. So, okay, so Anne will um, help us out by making those additional, uh, those changes to comply with the law. And if there's nothing else, all right, we'll move on. Thanks again, Anne. Um, okay, policy development, second reading, policy 519, interviews of students by outside agencies. We did discuss this policy a couple of weeks ago, and Flower, thank you very much for making those changes to reflect that some of our students live with guardians. Um, and I don't think there were any other um, suggestions or comments last week about this policy, anything, uh, or last meeting about this policy, any changes now? Tammy, anything from you? No, there's not really anything beyond what was changed that is changeable on our part, really. It's right, required. because again, this is a great example of a policy that is governed by law in a lot of situations as well. Okay. All right. Hearing no other comments there. Moving on. Uh, consent agenda. Um, 
Does anybody want to pull anything off of the consent agenda? No? Okay. Uh, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved. Moved by Ken. Is there a second? I'll second. Second by Colin. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any discussion? All right. Uh, it passes 7 0. Action agenda, approval of the second reading policy 519 interviews of students by outside agencies. Is there a motion to approve the policy as amended? So moved. Moved by Laura, and I'll give the second to Ann. All in favor? Aye. All opposed? Passes 7 0. Okay, the employment agreement of our um, new Children First Executive Director, who is Margaret Gagno. Uh, does anybody want to speak on that? Sarah, yeah, Chair Aston. Tom, I can speak okay. to that. So um, we, the Children First um, Executive Committee recently hired Margaret Gagno um, to serve as the next executive director. Um, as you'll see, the contract is um, it, it's very familiar and similar to the previous contract held by the former executive director of Children First. Um, the, the committee, it was a unanimous vote on behalf of the committee to hire um, Margaret. Um, and as you, you know and recall from the past that the school district serves as a pass-through for Children First. Children First is its own organization. And um, our partnership with um, Park Nicollet Foundation, um, the city of St. Louis Park and St. Louis Park Public Schools, we work to um, help support and provide guidance and oversight for um, this program that, that, that serves our community. So um, as an executive committee member, um, on behalf of the executive committee, we would recommend that the school board approve this contract for Margaret Gagno. And um, I just want to follow up, Superintendent Osai, to clarify that no school district funds um, are allocated to the salary of the Children First Executive Director. Uh, that, that is correct, Chair Tombeck. All of the funds for the executive director position um, for Children First are, are raised through different um, fundraising mechanisms. Um, and one of the actually been coming up next week, the Children First Annual Breakfast serves as a, as a tremendous um, fundraiser to help support the sustainability of this program. Great, and I think that that is um, an area that some folks in the community have been confused by because um, the executive director's office is uh, housed in the district office and she does have a um, slpschools.org email address, I believe. Um, and so although we do sign her employment agreement, we do not actually pay that from our general fund or our other salaries. This is not one of the salaries that's included in the 85 percent uh, <laughs> salaries and benefits. And I would like to um, also just welcome Ms. Gagno because I, she is actually only the second official executive director of Children First in all of its time in St. Louis Park. Um, Ms. Wells, Deborah Wells um, graciously served as the interim for the last few months following Karen Atkinson's uh, retirement. But yeah, so Margaret is only the second person coming into this job. And I know I speak for the rest of the board when I say we're very excited to see what um, she can do with this institution and how she can expand it to further benefit um, the students and the, all the children in St. Louis Park. So. I kind of maybe jumped the gun there. Who knows what's going to happen in the next minute. But is there a motion to approve this contract? So moved. Moved by Laura. Is there a second? Second. Second by Ken. All in favor? Aye. Passes 7-0. Now everything I said before officially applies. Welcome, Margaret, and we all look forward to meeting you. All right. Last step, communications and transmittals. Who has stuff to talk about tonight? I do. All right. Go ahead. Um, I am the school board liaison to our senior program at Lenox, and I was able to meet with Angie and Birdie about a week, week and a half ago, um, and just talking about how we can continue to um, strengthen the relationship between the senior program and the community and the schools. Um, and just talking about exploring ways that we could maybe make some connections between the senior program members and the students in the school. So um, I'll be continuing to meet with them and supporting their efforts and um, really looking forward to forming some positive relationships. Uh, 
I attended the St. Louis Public School. I cannot get better. I've been sick like for a month. I'm sorry. <clears throat> I am in the liaison to the St. Louis Park Public School Foundation Board. And um, the big thing that I wanted to share with you is that um, the mission of the board is to provide grants to the public schools um, above and beyond the curriculum or ways to enrich the curriculum and teachers apply for the grants and they use the money to um, buy something or just like I said to um, increase the classroom um, or take it like a step beyond the curriculum and um, so the grants have um, recipients for this year there are about 19 of them have received um, their letter of um, support and on April 15th there will be um, an event called the Grant Share Event where um, the recipients will be presenting what they are using their funds for. Um, and Sarah, you have to help me. Is it going to be in the cafeteria or in here? Um, to be determined yet. Okay, we're working on the So we'll give you details, but it is April 15th, um, and you are all invited, all school board members, to come see, um, and there will um, probably be food served. Yes, <laughs> there, I, the, there was some things that are being worked out, as you can tell, but, um, and I will give you more information as the, the date gets closer, but mark that on your calendar, because it's very exciting to see what our teachers are doing, um, and I mean, I hear, like, at some point, drones might have been used yes. for money for drones, and really cool things, I think, going on, so it's definitely worthwhile to attend. Thank you. And I would um, just add to that that yeah. it would be great for um, any of us to attend who can because our racial affinity groups were one of the recipients of a grant um, this past year. And so um, that has been of a benefit to our staff of color. And we would like to be able to continue to um, express our gratitude to the Public Schools Foundation for that support. So. <clears throat> um. Wanted to, uh, one of the things that I talked about a, a couple weeks ago was the cable uh, franchise renewal process here in the city of St. Louis Park. And it was amongst uh, about five other updates. So I kind of rushed through it a little bit, but I want to take just a little bit more time because um, there we are in the process of doing that. The city of St. Louis Park is working with Comcast and there's a lot of things that we could benefit from um, and things that we can ask for and request as we're looking to um, renew that franchise. And for those of you who are watching at home here, this is one of the reasons why you're able to watch us is because of that um, agreement with the city of St. Louis Park and, and Comcast. And there are things like the number of government channels that are allotted, the quality of the channels, the, the equipment, things and resources within the um, facilities, things within the community, and some other opportunities. And so if you have strong opinions about these things, um, even if you have moderate opinions about these things, there's an easy online survey to take. I took about 10 minutes or so to um, do it the other day. It's open through March 3rd. I encourage anybody to um, take that survey, fill out some information about how they watch cable TV here, when do they watch, do you watch the government channels, why, those kinds of things. And I just think it's a great opportunity to make sure that it's one of the ways that we keep people informed. And even if you say, well, I watch it on the internet, I watch it on YouTube or whatever, again, that's another way that you're able to do that is through the use of that equipment and things. So I think it's, I really appreciate it. We talked earlier tonight about transparency and things like that, making sure that what we do here is available to people and what the city does and, and um, also showcasing our awesome students and faculty and all the amazing things that happen in our community. So um, it's really easy to find on that website right now. If you go to the homepage, it's hard to miss. Otherwise, look under Park TV and you'll see that information um, right on there. Thank you. Okay, for the last few meetings, well, all of the meetings so far, I haven't been able to provide any information, but now I have something. So <laughs> I, I hope I don't go too long because I had a really busy couple of weeks. So um, we started with Aquila. We have the liaison for Aquila. So we went to their school, their uh, PTO meeting, and um, the city had two people come to there. It was, one was a community outreach person of which he talked about some internships that the city is going to have, of which we, he's encouraging people to apply for those. Um, and then also there was a community um, kind of event person there, and there's a Shamrock Bowl coming up. I think it's March 14th. That um, sounds like fun. It's going to be at The Rock, 
and it's um, going to be bowling with teams of four people or more. So um, those are two great things. And then Seeds came, and they were talking about a grant that they received for a mobile um, mobile farm that they're going to be putting together and um, bringing uh, bringing into the community this summer. So I saw thought that was really exciting, and I'm going to participate on that one as far as developing that mobile farm and um, helping to do things, because I always want to do that tiny house thing, and tiny house things is right in line with that. So anyway, um, and then, um, so for many, many years, probably seven years, um, the civil rights experience came and talk comes and talks to us about uh, the kids that gone on their tours, and every year I said, I wish I could be a chaperone, and every year I, well, three of the years I tried to get my kids to do it. Um, so uh, I had the opportunity that one of my kids is actually going to do it. So um, third time's a charge, or a charm. Um, I'm not going to be able to be a chaperone, but um, I, I have been able to go and experience some of those Saturday classes that they have. And um, that is, it's phenomenal. It's just, it's just a, a beautiful experience. Um, I always say every year, I wish that everybody could experience that. Um, everyone should and could experience that. And um, I know we can't experience the whole thing. Not all of our kids can, but we could bring some of that learning to this building. So um, that's something that we should probably talk about and see if we can um, get some of that education here. Um, also, um, so that's going to be exciting. They're going to be uh, coming back after spring break, and I, I imagine they're going to talk to us, and I'll have more to say about it then. Um, have a wellness committee meeting this week on Wednesday, of which um, you know some of the conversations were around wellness today on that we can't well we weren't able to comment on but um, I, I think that was spot on what they were talking about and um, I'm excited really excited about where we're going in this district with the wellness and the food and, and the um, nutrition and everything um, I've been um, not so excited about it a few years ago, but um, I think that we're really moving along, and um, I, I think it's going to be a great experience. It's going to be a great ride, um, and it's going to take some finances that uh, we don't expect <laughs> that uh, we hope that we can mitigate. So um, that's all I'm going to talk about. So thank you. So then, <laughs> so then um, I had an opportunity to go on to um, MSB had a, um, a, they wanted to see what um, curriculum should look like for other than just going to college. And, um, and went to a meeting four hours on, uh, at the uh, North Hennepin Community College. And um, it was really, really good. It's a different process on trying to identify um, different pathways that people can take. Um, but um, I was able to meet a couple of college guys there that uh, we exchanged numbers, and now we're on LinkedIn. And so it's uh, a great communication that we had there. And then we had um, Friday was um, career and um, – Career in college advisory, college advisory board. board. Thank you. That uh, we had this last Friday. It was uh, it was a kind of like a speed dating, but you're interviewing kids, and um, and getting them to understand what it takes to um, to network and to um, apply for jobs and what kind of college uh, paths you can take for uh, different opportunities. So again, that was another great experience to sit and talk with kids. Kind of exemplifying here how much work can go into this yeah. job in a couple of weeks since we have we all have had periods like those we all will have more periods like those so thank you so much Ken for really for just killing it the last yeah. couple of weeks with your meeting attendance. <laughs> I'll be silent for the next one. <laughs>
Um, I want to talk about a couple of important upcoming events. We have a school board listening session this Saturday, February 29th, the extra day of the year 2020, uh, at 10 a.m. in the uh, main conference room here at St. Louis Park High School, which you enter into from door one. Um, a listening session is a little bit different from the open forum that we had here tonight. Um, at the open forum, you're speaking to the entire board, and the board doesn't really talk, isn't, doesn't have an opportunity to speak back. It's not really a conversation. A listening session um, is a conversation that you get to have with um, three or fewer board members. And it looks like um, it'll be me, uh, myself, Colin, and Heather um, on, on Saturday. So we will look forward to, um, to meeting you and hearing from you then. Um, at our last meeting, Colin and I spoke about having been at a SEAC event about um, the upcoming caucus and primary election, which are happening tomorrow and next Tuesday. So caucus tomorrow, caucuses, if you remember, are run by the political parties and that they're doing party business this year. Party business not including the presidential nomination election. That is now going to happen in a primary election next Tuesday, March 3rd, at your normal polling place. Um, if you have any questions about the primaries, about the caucuses, the, um, the website mnvotes.org, which is the office of the Minnesota Secretary of State, um, has a ton of information. There's little flyers. There's um, some really great information. Also, there, um, the city of St. Louis Park has um, put out a voting guide which is amazing, and you can probably even see it on the camera. It's hot pink, mm -hmm. so it's hard to miss. <laughs> and if you see one of these um, around, grab it. Um, I actually I missed it at my, I don't know how I did um, at my at the last election, but it has the map of all the wards and the polling places and um, information about voting in St. Louis Park. So the, um, some great information on both of these um, and both of these places. I know that a lot of that information is also online at the. Um, St. Louis Park, City of St. Louis Park website. So go and get your voice heard. One of the next, both of the next two Tuesdays. Thanks. All right. I think our communications and transmittals tonight be, may be longer than our actual meeting. And that's totally fine because now it's my turn to talk. Uh, and I will just say that I actually attended um, this past Thursday night, and I think Superintendent Osai had the opportunity to attend as well, our high school's spring musical, which was Hairspray. And I will admit to being at times um, uncomfortable or um, having thoughts and feelings about some, uh, I had never seen the movies before, um, about some of the racial, uh, and as Ms. Sanchez spoke to tonight, like fat shaming and things that were in this play, um, in this musical. And I, I, I continue to wonder whether I want our students to be engaged in something like this, but here's what I am really happy about. Um, for whatever uh, racial stereotypes or tropes were perpetuated by this play that was written in the 80s, it is set in the 60s, um, it has been my understanding that it has um, intentionally sparked and um, fostered communication among our students about what all of this has meant and to be discussing what it means for them now in to be students in 2019 and to be performing this and having these discussions. And there were um, students of color playing white students and vice versa. There were um, uh, students who identify as boys playing women and vice versa. And so, you know, we, there, there is a lot of meat on the bones of that play. And so I'm continuing to think through it and sort through it about how I feel about it, to be honest. But the one thing that is very clear and that it was undeniable is that we have students who have tremendous amount of talent in this school. Mm -hmm. And we have, judging from the amount of the screeches in, from the um, row behind me, we have a lot of enthusiastic support among students for their friends uh, who are performing, from our musicians, um, to our actors and singers. It was just, like I said, tremendous talent and excitement and enthusiasm from our students. So thank you very much to Mr. Miskowski and to Lil Zumberg. And I think I'm missing some adults who, I'm sure I'm missing lots of adults who were involved in that production. Um, but I am grateful that our students have the opportunity to engage in those discussions and to um, share their talents with our community. So. 
Anything else? I have one more. Yes, all right. <laughs> Being that my daughter is a Nordic skier, I want to celebrate our junior, Danny Walsh, who did on February 14th compete at the state um, individual um, race in Giants Ridge. He um, finished well and I think 83rd um, uh, in the state, and he's just a tremendous leader on the team as well. And so I just really want to give a shout out to him. All right, yes. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Of course, I'm kidding. So, so um, I, I I probably downplayed the civil rights experience thing a little bit, but I took some numbers on what it is on as far as the participation of adults that are in this this program. Um, I when I was there, it was at the University of Minnesota. It was a very very large room. There was probably 130 people there, and of that, that's parents of all kinds of backgrounds and students. And um, the participants that were there as far as teachers or people that are going on the, trail, the field trips, there's two of them, by the way. The one's going south and one's going east. My daughter's going east. Um, but um, there was two people from U of M. There was four teachers from Minneapolis, two from St. Louis Park. There was five from Wyzetta. And um, no, sorry, that's six two from St. Anthony, and then there was two artists that are going on each of the trips that are going to document it and photograph and all things like that. And then there was two staffs from a, um, from a like an advertising agency. So um, it, it was really, 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 really cool. So anyway, and Dr. Stevens is also presenting and doing some of the education on these Saturday events. So um, cheers for St. Louis Park. Always. Okay. Is there a motion to adjourn? I'll move. Collins moving to adjourn. Second? Second. Second by Ann. All in favor? Aye. Passes 7-0. Let's go home. Good night, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you.